Dear Lord, we just thank you for who you are. Uh, we thank you for, for what you've done, Lord. Yeah. And right. Lord, we just, right now we submit to you. We submit to your will. But we just ask that as we draw near to you, as we dive into your word, and as we, as we seek your face today, Lord, that you draw near to us and that you reveal to us what you have in your word. I mean, we just thank you for the hearts that you've prepared, Lord. We just thank you that you, that you love us. We thank you for how much you love us. And so, Lord, we just humbly come before you today, seeking your will for our lives. And we just pray that you unlock something inside of us that lights us on fire for you and your mission. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, we're going to be in the book of Mark, chapter 12, today. So if you want to turn your Bibles to Mark. 12, and we're going to start in verse 13. If you didn't see last week's message, I highly recommend you go back um, and watch it. I don't know if it's been posted to YouTube yet or if it's just on Facebook, but um, we did meet some of the leaders of, of Hill City, and then Pastor John was absolutely on fire last week. Um, and he preached a message that I have not seen him preach in a long time. He was on fire from start to finish, so I highly recommend you go and watch that. But he talked a lot about being holy, like Miss Linda said um, during worship. Is, is he talked about, you know, God has asked us to be holy as I am holy. And he, he said that one of the ways that you do is you kind of have to let go of some of the things of this world. And so I, I really felt like with the climate of this world right now, the political tension is absolutely unmatched. And so where we're going to start today in Mark is after Jesus has cleaned the temple. You see, Jesus has cleared the temple of all of the, the people that were selling and using God's holy place. His place of worship is a, is a place to, to sell things and to rob people. And to, so Jesus could be fashion the whip and he cleared the temple. And so when he comes back the next day, these Pharisees, they begin to ask him a series of questions. They begin to challenge him with all of these things. And they begin to try to trap him into saying something that, that would uh, really kind of destroy him and his ministry. And so as we're going to start here in, in verse 13, they're, they've turned to a political question. They've tried some other tactics that obviously haven't worked. And so here they're going to try this political trap. And so we'll start Mark 12, verse 13. And they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius for me to look at. And they brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were amazed at him. Now this is a very well-known passage. Yeah. And a lot of times, because it's well-known, and this is often quoted, you know, give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God's. And we may be able to just kind of skim over what's really going on here, what the question truly is that they're asking him. The, the depth of what is being asked is not just simply, should we pay taxes? Because, see, the poll tax that they're talking about, there are lots of taxes in Rome. There's lots of taxes as far as for goods and for all these things you should do. The poll tax is an annual tax. And it's a denarius, which is a small amount of money. It's probably what we would consider to be about a quarter today. And so it's not the amount of money that people don't like in this deal. It's not this, oh, we're burdened with all these taxes. But this is really a, a head tax 
that basically says every person needs to pay Caesar a denarius every year just for having the privilege of being my servants. And so it's really just this reminder of the oppression that Rome has over the Jewish people at this point. And so nobody likes this tax. And it's, it's, it's very, very entrapping. It's one of those things. But what they're asking here is something very, very specific. Because, see, about 25 years earlier, there was a man called Judas the Zealot that was from Galilee. And he, being a zealot, absolutely hated any kind of Roman rule. In fact, he started a rebellion. He started a revolt against this tax. And he came into the temple, he got a band of people, and he cleared the temple. He cleared out all the Romans, he cleared out all the Gentiles, he cleared out everybody, and basically just said, no, listen, we, we worship nobody but God. We are bringing in the kingdom of God. We are not going to bow down to any person. We're not going to bow down to any idol. We are not going to pay taxes. And he looked at every Jewish person and said, if you pay tax to the Romans, you are supporting idol worship. Because the Romans took that tax and they built temples to idols. They considered themselves gods. And he said, no, if you are a true follower of Yahweh, of God, it, 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 then you will not pay taxes. And he had this huge revolt. Well, obviously the German, or the Jewish, or the Roman people come in, they fought him, they captured him, and they killed him, crucified him. So when they asked Jesus this question, should we pay taxes or not? Keep in mind, Jesus just cleared the temple. Jesus just went in and drove out everybody that was the money changers and all the, the people that were not doing things. Keep in mind that Jesus' first sermon was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So what are they asking? They're not saying should you pay taxes or not. See, because if you just look at it as this is a very common um, parable that Jesus is telling or a story that Jesus is telling, you would think that, well, he's just trying to say, well, do you pay taxes or not? Are you going to get in trouble with the Romans or in trouble with the Jews? They're actually saying no. Are you going to start rebellion? Are you somebody that is going to start a revolt? And that's something serious. And when I look at it, I look at who, who come to ask him the question. Because so often it says the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're all challenging him. See, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're on opposite ends of the religious spectrum. One believes in resurrection, one does not believe in resurrection. But here it says the Pharisees and the Herodians came to question. And see, the Pharisees and the Herodians are on the opposite side of the political spectrum. Pharisees kind of lean more towards the zealot side, where they believe that you worship God and God alone, and we shouldn't have to pay taxes to any man. Well, the Herodians, they supported Roman rule. They were, they were a group of Jewish people, but they were part of the government. And they, they got to participate in the, in the kind of luxuries of Rome because they supported what Herod was doing and they supported the Roman rule. So it's amazing to me what kind of alliances will come against Jesus or those of us that say that we're followers of Jesus. It's funny when you say that why are these two people that don't agree at all, all of a sudden coming and attacking together as one. And it's kind of funny that it happened to Jesus even then. The Herodians were coming in. And see, this is the deal, is that Jesus says, yes, pay your taxes. And the Pharisees and everybody else of the fallen say, well, he was just really blowing the smoke. He really didn't mean what he said. Because if you say to pay taxes, that means that just fall in line with the Romans, go ahead and support the I don't worship, go ahead and do all that. But if he says, no, don't pay your taxes, the Herodians turn right around and go to Rome and say, hey, he's an enemy of Rome. He's trying to start a revolt. He's trying to tell everybody not to pay their taxes. So this is, this is a big deal. Jesus is kind of trapped here. He, he actually says it. He looks at us, why are you trying to trap me? Why are you trying to test me? So Jesus sees this. But Jesus also answers this question in such a way that I think we truly need to pay attention here. Because although I don't think we need to be just hugely political, Jesus 
point something out here. And you know today, in, in a political system today, when you ask a politician a hard question, a lot of times they just give a talking point and ignore the question, or they talk in circles around the question. And when they're done, how many times have you sat here and looked at the TV or the person and you're just like, what? you didn't answer the question. I have no idea where you stand. What do you truly believe? And you're frustrated or you're angry. Or What were these guys? These guys weren't frustrated or angry. They were amazed at his answer. And so I think it's really important that we understand how he answered this and what he meant by this. Because when Jesus says, give me a denarius, what does that mean? He said he didn't have a denarius. He didn't have a quarter to his name. And you can actually go online and you can look up a denarius. And he says, whose inscription is, is on this? And it said, it said, Caesar, Tiberius, son of Augustus. A couple other words that said, high priest. But see, all Roman Caesars felt themselves as gods. And so it says, I am. Jesus is holding the coin in his hands. Whose, whose image is this? And the image on that coin says, I am king, son of a god, and high priest. Jesus. So now we got two players. We got Caesar, the Tiberius, and we got Jesus. Both of them claiming to be the king, to be the son of God, and to be the high priest. And what, what Jesus is saying in this answer is he's not saying, I'm going to come in and start a rebellion, and I'm going to be a better leader than Caesar. He's not saying, I am going to be a better leader than what you have. I'm not going to be a better leader or a different leader than the Romans. What he's saying is, I am completely revolutionizing revolutions. He's saying, I am going to start a revolution that you know nothing about, you don't understand, and will totally turn revolution on its head. Because you've got two kings. Two kings. And one king has his picture on the coin. So literally... Every single coin is his. It was printed from his stash of silver. It was printed by his printing press, and it was given to everybody. He owns all the coins. You've got a king who lives in palaces, and Jesus says that foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I have no place to lay my head. You have a king who demands that people bow down and worship him, and you've got Jesus who spends the first half of the Gospels telling everybody, don't tell anybody what I did. You've got this huge difference between these leaders. You've got this huge dichotomy between what kind of person are you going to follow? And see, Jesus, he answers that question with the render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God what is God's. Because See, when, when they ask the question, they ask it in two ways. They said, is it lawful to give taxes, to pay taxes to Caesar, and should we give taxes or should we not? So they kind of state the question, and then they lay it out in very, very simple terms. Yes or no? Give me an answer. Way too often, right now, in our political system, in our political atmosphere, People are saying, are you on the right or are you on the left? People are saying, do you believe in this or do you believe in that? Yes or no? And I, I tell you right now, I think that we need to follow Jesus' lead. Don't you dare put Jesus in a box when he wasn't willing to do it himself. And if you claim to be a Jesus follower, I wouldn't put yourself in a box. Jesus answers the question in a way that both says yes and no. In a way that they can, but can't. Hold them account. Because Jesus doesn't allow the political simplicity of a yes or no answer. See, now listen, Jesus is very, very simple and very, very straightforward when it comes to almost everything else. When it comes to everything else, about the kingdom of God, about who his father is, about what it, what it is of salvation, about the way the truth, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the father except through me. He has no problem saying yes and no. 
He has no problem drawing the line. But here he doesn't do that. Here he doesn't do that. He says, render Caesar with Caesar's. And see, when they say at the beginning, when they ask that question, should we give Caesar money? So we give him the taxes. Jesus is rendered to Caesar, which is a different word. See, in, in the NIV, it says give in both places, but it's a different word used. The first one is give out a gift. Should I, should I have a tribute? Should I give you something for having the privilege of being your servant? And Jesus says, no, it's his pictures on it. It's his anyway. Giving back what's due to him. It's like if I have your jacket and I give you your jacket, I'm rendering my jacket, your jacket back to you. It's not like I'm gifting you a jacket. I'm just rendering it back to you. I'm giving you back what I was already yours. And so Jesus isn't saying, by saying, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. He's not saying, you need to just bow down to Caesar. What he's saying is, give him what is due. Give him what he already owns. Give it back to him. Paul says the same thing in Romans 13 when he says, and he says, render what is owed to those that are owed, whether it's taxes or whether it's you know this or that, whatever. Just give it back to him. Whatever's owed to somebody, give it to him. And that's the same thing Jesus is saying. So, so why are you asking me if I need to give this coin to Caesar? It's got his picture and his inscription. It's got everything on it. It's his anyway. Give it to him. But give to God what is God's. And God doesn't have his image on any coin. God has his image on you. And so Jesus is not saying, stop paying taxes. We're going to start a rebellion. Jesus is saying, I'll start a rebellion by saying, you do not give what has God's image on it to Caesar. He said, do not give to Caesar what is God's. Your allegiance, your belief, your loyalty, your worship, that goes to God. So Jesus is starting rebellion. It's going to revolutionize rebellions. So Jesus, the best way to kind of explain what Jesus is talking about is in, in Luke chapter 6. In Luke 6, verse 20, he says, Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who hunger. Blessed are you who weep. Blessed are you that are hated. And he says, But woe to you that are rich, and woe to you that are full. Woe to you that when men speak of you, they speak of you well. See, Jesus hits on a few key points. He hits on wealth. He hits on comfort. He hits on recognition. And he hits on power. And those are all things that earthly rebellions fight for. Every time a committee is formed, every time a war is fought, every time somebody steps up to try to take charge of something, they're looking for wealth, they're looking for comfort, they're looking for recognition, and they're looking for power. That's the things of this world. Like we've talked about, we've got a king who owns all the money versus a king who gave away every penny they had. They bought food and gave the rest away. You have a king who lives in palaces and a king who doesn't have a place to lay his head. You've got a king who has absolute wants, absolute demands, absolute power from his subjects. And here you've got the God of the universe that the whole time he was on planet Earth gave away his power. That's all he did was give away his power. You've got a king that needs to be recognized versus a king that doesn't be recognized. Do you see the difference in the kings that we're trying to follow here? Do you see the fact that when Jesus is trying to show us, not only in this political statement, not only in this political environment, but all throughout all of life, that the four things we fight about never solve a problem. Nothing changes no matter who wins the rebellion here on earth. All it, all it does is the leaders change. The people that are in charge change. The people that have the money change. Nothing else changes. 
nothing. Jesus said, I'm here to turn that on its head. Pastor John says all the time, if you can find anywhere in the Bible where God does something predictable, where Jesus does something predictable, <laughs> show me. Because he doesn't. He doesn't do anything predictable. Jesus turns all this on his head. And they were amazed at him. How often have you been in a political discussion with friends, family, or co-workers, and at the end of it, somebody says, wow, they were amazed at that. How many of you want to be able to have a discussion with somebody at the end of it saying, okay, that's good, I like that. Because I'll tell you right now, if you need to bring up politics, you're fighting with somebody. I know I have family members, and I'm sure everybody else does, so that you just avoid that subject altogether. You don't even, you can't even bring it up. Because people are asking, should we or shouldn't we? Yes or no? Do you or don't you? What do you believe on this or this? And so often we, we hold so tight to our beliefs. And listen, I thought that this was really about the political climate. When I was preparing for this message this week, I thought that as a church, we need to learn how to let go of some of these earthly things and let go of some of these deep-held beliefs and this, this conviction that we have towards these political beliefs and, and gravitate towards being holy like God is holy. And I'm telling you, after men's group yesterday, for those of you who are there, I think it, it, it cascades way further than just political beliefs. I think that there are some strongholds that the church has to go way past what we believe politically. I think there's some I need to be right feelings in a lot of different things, and a lot of it has to do with the beliefs in this church. And I think we have to be willing to look at, at Christ's example on this. I think we have to strive to be holy because he is holy and let go of the things in this earth, but we have to do it in a way that Christ example. See, Christ denies three things. He denies political simplicity, political complacency, and political supremacy. He denies all of that. He doesn't say that politics is the end all be all, that you've got to be involved in politics, you've got to go, but he doesn't say it's a simple thing on the right or on the left, and he also doesn't say, mm, don't wash my hands of it. He doesn't, he doesn't say any of those. He said, listen, you need to be involved. You need to be of the, you need to be in this world, but not of it. You need to have your part. You need to give to Caesar. It's his. But give to God what is his. And you need to stand on those principles. Because if you don't stand on those, if you don't stand on that, if you don't be able, if you're not able to stand and say, I'm giving to God what is God's, if you don't do that, you're giving to Caesar what's God's. And if you're completely ignoring what Caesar has to say, then you have no impact on the world around you because you're not participating in the world that you live in. Jesus doesn't do that either. And it's so easy to look at this and just say, this is a simple, pay your taxes or don't. But Jesus is, is using this example as a way for us to have every conversation that we have with our friends and family to have every conversation we have in the Bible study, every conversation that we have at work, Jesus has given us this example to say, listen, you need to understand whose image is on you. You need to understand who loves you. You need to understand what you represent when you go into every place you go into. Do not think that you are just holier than thou. You still need to render to people what is owed to them. You still need to behave yourself in a way that is worthy of God. <clears throat> but you got to know whose symbol, whose impression, whose likeness is on you. You've got to understand that. You've got to know that. And you've got to live that. <clears throat> You can't be surprised by the forces that come against you. You can't be surprised by the testing that's going to come your way. Jesus kind of chuckles at this. And I, I, this actual 
story is in both or all three Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I, I love Mark's Mark's version of it. And he's he's a little bit more uh, sarcastic than the other ones. I think he's got a little bit more of a sense of humor than the other ones. Um, but you can almost you can almost kind of sense some of the sarcasm when they say, "Teacher, we know that you are, you know, truthful. You don't defer to anybody, and you don't." listen to anybody. I can almost hear the cynicalness in that. But you know that's how he was. But you know that they weren't saying that in a reverent way. You know they were kind of, yeah, we know you think you're better than anybody else. We know that you don't listen to anybody else. All these great teachers here, you don't listen to anybody else. And Jesus is like, why are you trying to try? Why are you testing? I love the, because it, it, it reflects perfectly what's going on today. It's like nobody will say anything genuine. Nobody will say anything truthful. Nobody will truly say, listen, I, I hear your intelligence and I know your experience and I, I know what you've been through. They don't say that without going, mm, yeah, I know you think really. I know you think really. That's the way this, and it's just kind of, to me, that's the way it reads off the page here. And I just, I, I love that aspect of this particular group of scriptures translates right into where we are today. So where does that leave us politically? Where does that leave us socially? Where does that leave us where we stand? So okay, so we're going to follow Christ's example, but what really does that mean? Done a lot of talking about how Jesus kind of answered this with give to God and give to Caesar and do all that, but what does that truly mean? I think that it truly means that when you become a follower of Christ, Christ brings you into his family. He brings you into himself. He, he, he comes into you and you begin to walk like he walks. And we just talked about how much he loves us. And we all sang that song, oh, he loves us. But yet we look at somebody on an opposite political party and we say they're they're the problem. They're they're the they're the evil. They're what's wrong. But if Christ is in you and he is love, you stop looking at the other person as the problem. And you start to have a conversation with them because you know. They're just another person. See, I don't think that it changes your political beliefs. But if you're far right or far left and you become a Christian, it softens your opinion on who the enemy is. Not on your belief on what's right or wrong. Don't mistake that. We're not talking about, oh, I can overlook this and overlook that. If something is right or wrong, you've got to stand on it. But it definitely softens you on it. Who, who the enemy is you're fighting. If you're in the middle, there's a reason you're in the middle. You're a moderate or just whatever. It's, just, it's because you either have no hope or because you're just complacent and don't really care about anything else. You're going to stay the way it is. And when you become a Christian, that doesn't last either. Because you now have hope. You have all the hope of heaven. You have all the hope of Christ in you. You have all the hope that you can be holy like he is holy. And you're not thinking of yourself. See, you're not thinking about how do I get rich? How do I become comfortable? How do I get recognition? And how do I become powerful? You're thinking about all of the power of the Trinity, of all of heaven has been given to me. How do I give that away? You're thinking about all the wealth I have. How do I provide for the needs of my family? And then how do I provide for everybody else? So you stop thinking about all the things this world thinks about. You stop fighting for all the things this world fights for. And the minute you can stop fighting about that, the minute you can just let go of that, Hallelujah. you get a sense of inner peace yeah. that is absolutely amazing. And see, listen, mm -hmm. Jesus, he is not a well living water. He's a spring living water. He is not a 
a lake of living water, he is rivers of living water. Because that water, that living water, that inner peace, those things that you get for having Christ in you, it's not for you to keep. It's not a, a pool of water that you get to hoard. It is something that flows through you and you share. Amen. And you begin to walk out what Christ walked out. And you know why you can do that? It's because you're not holding on to those things. Like Pastor John said last week, you're not trying to drag the world with you. You're walking with open hands and just letting God's grace flow. Letting the love that Christ has given us flow. Because you know whose seal you bear. You know what you stand for. You know who you are. You know that you are loved and you are a child of God. Which also makes it very easy to say, you know, it's yours, have it. I'm not going to fight you because you want taxes for me. The taxes, they have your pitch. Mine doesn't have Caesar on it. It's got George Washington on it. I mean, some of you may have Benjamin Franklin or some of the other guys. Mine's got George Washington on it. I just hand it over. It's yours anyway. Take it. Yeah. Or even like Christ, I may not even have, you know, the little silver ones with George Washington on it. I don't know. Just get it. I don't care. Take it. Listen. Christ didn't get every dime that he got out. He took care of his family. They ate well. You never hear about him with holes in their sandals. You never hear him. He took care of his family, but everything else went out. Everything else went. What did he say? The real religion that Christ loves is to take care of the world. What did they tell Paul when he came back to Jerusalem? He said, just make sure you take care of the poor. Something that we were eager to do anyway. Those things are easy to do the minute you can let go of the wealth, the recognition, comfort, and of the power. That only happens when Christ is in you. Because, listen, it's not a coincidence that today on Pentecost Sunday, today, the day that God gave birth to the church by releasing the Holy Spirit into this world, that I'm preaching on a new kind of rebellion, on a new kind of mission, to make sure we understand what fight we're supposed to be fighting. And listen, political realm, yes, but every other realm as well. Everything you fight, every classroom battle, every work battle, every Bible study, every home family discussion, everything you know about this world needs to be turned on its head. It is no longer about me. You know, I'm not one for, you know, catchphrases and all the, the big movements that happen all the time, but this I am second movement. Are you? Can you really put yourself second? Or do you have to be right in arguments? Are you really fighting for power in your home with your marriage? With your kids? With your boss? And they're trying to make you to drive back to work every day for no reason. Amen. Are you really trying to fight that battle? Or are you just saying, you know what, Randy, it's your job anyway. You're the one paying me. You know, I guess I'll drive to work. Are you willing to fight that battle because you want the power? It's a question I just want to ask you. I mean, today, honestly, in every part of your life, is your opinion being heard more important than people knowing the love of Christ? Come on. Come on. Because I know some of the most godly people in the world that when a question is asked, the only thing they want is for you to hear their opinion. Yeah. Well. And so I ask you, in every situation, are you giving your opinion? Are you making sure that your voice is heard? Are you making sure your story is known? Are you making sure that everything that you have to say has been said? <laughs> are you living like the king who has no quarter, no bed, no palace, no recognition, and every ounce of his power he's given away? He is the creator of the universe, and he has more power. He, he speaks in a legion of armies just fall down. And what does he do? He says, all oh, my power, I give to you. Amen. Come on. The first sermon I talked about where he said, 
Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. He also talked about the kingdom of heaven. Way too often here, when we say kingdom of heaven, what do you think? Too many people here think one of two things. They think it's a far off place in heaven, somewhere way out there in space, or they, they spiritualize it. And it's, it's somewhere inside of me. It's, it's, what, you know, it's, it's inside of me. You know, it's, it's kind of my private life, and it's something I kind of keep in church and at home. And Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't live that way. He, he, he spoke out of Isaiah in his first sermon. And he said, I am here. I have come to proclaim freedom to the captives, sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf. I have come to set people free. He has come to bring the kingdom of heaven and actually do something. Kingdom of heaven is here. Are you grabbing it for yourself? Are you trying to find this well of living water that you get to guard? Are you a spring of living water that just can't help but to say, you know what? It's mine is yours. So that's my challenge today is for you just to honestly think about where you are in your political life as well as everywhere else. When you think about your next conversation, think about the two lords you're serving. There's, there are two lords. They both think they're gods. They both think they're kings. And they both think they're high priests. One is fighting for everything in this world that, like we said, will never change. Top players will change every now and then. But nothing else will change. Or you got Jesus Christ who turned everything about rebellion on its head. You see, when Christ was in Jerusalem, there was also somebody in prison called Barabbas. And they freed Barabbas and killed Jesus. Why did they do that? Because if you free Barabbas, you can stop him. What's Barabbas going to do? He's going to go get another group of military people. He's going to go get another group of insurrectionists. I can go hunt him down and kill him. I can stop him. What did they do to Judas the Zealot? They stopped it. Do you know that every king, every president, every leader in the world today has no power until he's elected or given power or given the throne? Christ's power truly began when he died. He turned everything on his head. Take all the money away from the zealots. They have no power. Christ gave away every dime he had. Which Lord are you following? And if you claim to follow Jesus Christ, that you're fighting for wealth, comfort, recognition, or power, maybe we need to take a step back and ask God, do you know me? Do you know me? So, are we ready to join Christ in his rebellion today? Yeah. On Pentecost Sunday, are we ready to step out of this church? Quit being religious. Are we ready to step out of this church? Quit looking at how I can get ahead. Are we ready to look out and say, hey, the world is turned upside down. Take my money. Take my power. Keep my recognition. You know what? That just makes me stronger. Because that's how Christ lived. See, everybody else, their power begins when their reign starts. Christ said, you know what? Take my life. Because from that moment on, you can't stop me. They would rather give the power to anybody that will get an M16 and go and shoot up any place ever. They'll say, you know what? Those people can live all they want because we can stop them. We can find them. You get somebody that walks out and says, God loves you. They want to put a stop to that. Yeah. <laughs> they can't handle that because they can't stop Jesus. They tried to stop Jesus. What they do? They crucified him and buried him. Three days later, he, planned, he, he provided the biggest coup in history. When the, when the stone was rolled away, he stepped out of that grave. Right. See, you can't stop the love of God. You can't stop Christ. You can stop anybody with a weapon. You can stop anybody with an agenda. You can stop anybody that has strength. You can't stop Jesus. Amen. Is that how you're walking today? Is that how you're fighting your battles today? Are you fighting with the power of Jesus Christ? And the love in your heart that says, the person over here is not the enemy. The person on the side of the aisle is not the enemy. Right. Are you drawing a line and say yes or no? 
or you say, listen, I'm giving everything that belongs to God to go. You can have what's yours. Amen? Yeah. Father, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. Lord, we ask that you give us the boldness to walk out of here today proclaiming your love, walking in your confidence, Lord, knowing that it's not about the things that we hold on to here. It's not about the power and the money and the peace and the comfort, Lord. But it's about being confident and being okay with any circumstance because we know who is, who, whose image we bear. We know that when people see us, they tend to see you, Lord. And so we just thank you for what you've done. We thank you for who you are. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you're going to give us today to speak your gospel. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.